and you look at your friends, age does not matter, by the way, I always say. If people have the, the curiosity and the passion and the patience, that transcends age. Everyone who is in this orchestra has the ability to be patient, put in long hours that can often be frustrating, sometimes even make you angry, because you know that in the end, you will conquer it, and having done that, it will actually have much more meaning than something that comes quickly. That's a big idea here. Uh, we spend a lot of time on Sundays. Uh, we work harder on Sundays probably than you do in your school during the week. It's, it's an program that's beyond the level of almost every school music program, but that's, that's the beauty. You have something that lasts your whole life. Uh, and I'm aware of the sacrifice everyone makes. I'm aware of my own sacrifice for Sundays. And I'm reminded how much it's worth it when I, when I see what we have at the concerts. Uh, our students are not conformists. But to not conform doesn't just mean, mean being a rebel all the time. It means not doing things just because people tell you to do it. It means you make a decision that's informed, but once you decide to join, like you join our orchestra, you learn to regulate your ego. And understanding that to be an effective group member means also making sure that everyone around you succeeds. That's, that's a very important lesson in this orchestra. Our students are curious about everything. When I start the rehearsals, uh, I, I, you know, I have the, the students introduce themselves and they talk about their hobbies. It's unbelievable uh, the, the wealth of experience and difference you have. Everything you know, from, from sports I've never heard to all kinds of other pastimes I've ever heard. And all you people are doing so many fascinating things in the fields of science, in the fields of business. I mean, I get so shocked. Last year, uh, she graduated this year, but uh, a few years ago we had a, a fluidist who I found out was written up in business magazines, even though she, at the time I think she was a, a junior, because she had come up with a food website that had like three or four million followers. And so it, it, these kinds of things about um, students are always surprising. That's why I don't call any of you kids. Uh, you're my younger colleagues, and I mean that very seriously, because as it happens with Nathan, I, I often find I too, uh, I, you know, become equal colleagues and friendships with many of you. And I think you'll feel that way with you. I think our students also get excited about finding connections between things. Things you might not even think. We have, in other words, when you're doing music, your mind relates to another field. And that excitement of finding a discovery or playing a piece like we're going to do Copeland's Appalachian Spring, and I finally have this epiphany that what's going on in this really exciting dance movement was portended at the very beginning of the piece with three special notes. Those kinds of connections make it, it, it put chills down your spine. And that's one of the things that we, we love about the being in orchestra. Uh, I think our orchestra students also suspect the big game is to discover something meaningful to give back to the world. And that, that their own achievement is very important. But finding a way to give back in, in the world is really what it's about. Uh, friendships with like-minded souls. You'll find that the, that the students you meet here in Leo, in many ways, you have much more in common with than your school friends. You're with your school friends much more, many more hours. But you'll find that there is a there are things you understand with each other. Just looking, you kind of know. You have the same orientation to the world, and you're, you're all very serious. And so this is some of the things I think that are interesting. You'll discover that um, that respect for others is the beginning of being an adult. And, and that takes time. We have a lot of respect issues we learn as part of being part of society. And we can see it, and, you know, we, we have all kinds of lessons in modern day news. And we see it's the, the price for people not having respect for each other. How the level of conversation goes down to name calling. And we lose this wonderful, idea, uh, this wonderful world where we actually are conversing with ideas. And so I think that's important. Um, music playing in this thing is a lifetime. You know, if you play, if you play football, basketball, all of you can learn many of these same things from those sports. One of the difficulties is your body doesn't always allow you to do it when you're 90 years old. But when you are 90 years old, you can play music. And especially if you're playing music, chamber music, you'll still be doing it and you'll be listening to music the whole life. So you're learning something that's going to extend way beyond your school training. Uh, and then finally, the discipline, passion, and deep useful ideas you learn playing in orchestra, you're going to find directly apply to what you end up doing. Now, many of our students, despite my caution, decide to become professional musicians. I always, I always plead with them, think carefully. My, my, my mantra is don't go into music unless not going into music would make you miserable. 
And I find many students have discovered they'd be miserable not being in music. And that's fantastic. Many times they discover that later on. But just as many go on to incredible uh, uh, careers, radiology, law, you know, I, mean, I just, I, the things I hear are incredible, robotics and all that. I am absolutely convinced because people tell me that. I know Nathan is already starting to feel it, that the, what they learn in the orchestra does apply to these other subjects. There's a reason colleges look <coughs> at applications of students who have classical music. So I'm, I wanted just to take a second to talk about that because we have so many new students and, and it, it's a culture that's different than other youth orchestras. We have the widest distribution. We call ourselves Los Angeles Youth Orchestra because we have people coming from LA County and almost beyond. It's, 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 uh, it makes it very difficult because you're, you're going to have a mainly <coughs> culture, social economics, all kinds of things wider than even in your schools. We, we represent at least 60 schools. So it gives you some idea of what we're addressing. Let me talk about the music. So I'm, I'm a composer. I write music. That's my primary thing. I also love, like you, I love to play music. I'm a classical guitarist. I love the guitar day. I'm also a pianist. And uh, I also lecture about music. I lecture. I'm going to be actually lecturing for the LA Phil's opening concert at the end of the month. So I'm really, I am passionate about getting people excited about classical music. But what I love about youth orchestra is that what I've learned is if you take, like I said, the LA Philharmonic, and you go to a school and you play for them, people might get excited for a day, but it doesn't change their life. But you, like you guys, you learn these instruments that were made hundreds of years ago, and you have to suffer in this agonizing slow thing. It's not like an iPhone app, something you learn in 20 seconds, or video game, something you have to spend years playing to even get a decent sound. And what you learn from that is, is really uh, you, you, not only a discipline, but you end up having a love for the tradition and a love for the music. You are part of this tradition because you've spent so much freaking time learning, learning it, dealing with all, of all the limitations of these old technologies. And you discover, and this is what I think is so important for our species, you discover inside these old technologies is a sophistication much greater than we have in our other tracks. And so it should be, it'll get you thinking, how can we take that sophistication and bring it into our modern world? So those are some of the ideas I wanted to tell you. I work very hard on the music. Uh, I don't dumb it down. Both orchestras are playing absolute masterworks, and I'm excited conducting both of them. The uh, concert orchestra is doing one of the greatest symphonies ever written, Haydn's Oxford Symphony No. 92. We've never done this. No, no orchestra in the has ever done an Oxford symphony. Haydn wrote this. Haydn was the father of the symphony. He wrote 104 symphonies. And he wrote them almost in isolation. He was living outside of Vienna. We went to, we went to our, uh, we were on our Vienna Prague tour uh, two summers ago. We actually, or summer after before, we actually went to Haydn's house and saw how he worked with Prince Esperanzi, almost in isolation, uh, just doing all these symphonies for his court affairs. And then, then, when he was in his late 50s, he got asked to do a concert tour in England. He'd never been outside of, of you know, the, the environs of Austria. And he can't, couldn't speak English. And so he goes to Austria, and, I mean, he goes to England, and he needs to bring music with him. So he brought his latest symphonies. These are actually symphonies he brought in France. And they were so impressed, they gave him a doctorate. Oxford University gave him a PhD. And so the piece that he performed for the end of the issues is, was this symphony he wrote in France. It's called the Oxford Symphony. And it is definitely worthy of a PhD. It's one of the great works of all time. It's filled with Haydn's transparent, infectious melodies. And yet it has very deep ideas. The ideas of soul introduction actually play out to the whole work. It's the kind of piece that got Beethoven inspired. You'll know, hear parts that sound like Beethoven. And Mozart. And our whole tradition really comes from Haydn. We're also going to do one of the prettiest pieces of literature, the Russian Easter Overture by Rusty Korsakov in an arrangement. And this is a piece that has beautiful colors and also evokes the chanting, the Christian chanting of the plain chant. And so you'll hear that, and then you'll also hear, you'll, you'll hear this very moving uh, Russian, Russian folk songs. And Rusty Korsakov is kind of like the father of modern orchestration colors. So we're going to be doing that. Of those pieces in concert orchestra. The symphony orchestra is going to do some pieces I've always dreamed of playing. First of all, we're going to be doing um, Fanfare for the Common Man. This is a probably the most famous fanfare ever written. It's by Aaron Copeland, and uh, 
appropriate to say that, you know, on this day, today is 9 11, and uh, at least for all the parents, <laughs> and have lived through that, and met so many of the older students. Um, it was a day of de definition, because one of the things that happened in this tragedy was a sense of cohesion that we are a country together. Aaron Copeland wrote Fanfare for the Common Man. Uh, in the, uh, I believe it was the early, it was late 30s. And it, was, it had to do with coming out of the Depression, that actually was still in the Depression. And when he wrote this, uh, it was actually a fanfare project. A lot of composers wrote fanfares. And the person commissioned him was shocked at the title. It came from a poem. Actually, not a poem. It came from a speech from a, uh, from a, from a vice president at the time, Henry Wallace. And he, he talked about that this is the age, the 20th century is the age of the common man. And what that meant is, you know, this is not for, for just rich people or aristocracy. This is the time when the middle class common folk are going to be able to have a voice in the world. And that's what the stand for. So I think in 9-11 it's a very appropriate thing because the whole enlightenment ideas that led to the light in the United States of America had to do with this feeling of the, of the elevation of the common man, the enlightenment ideas that we're not going to live in a, in a class society where only a few people get to speak. And we're going to be able to trade ideas. So uh, at least that's my feeling with this stand for it's, 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 it's been played in so many ways that it's really identified with America. And Copeland's language he created for that, he was doing it explicitly. Because Theodore, I mean, Franklin Roosevelt, the president, had asked him and other composers to come up with a music that would speak to Americans. So he started writing in this very beautiful style that some people say reminds them of the open land of America, the open prairies, open fifths, open sonorities, and then using American folk tunes. And he wrote, wrote Rodeo, Billy the Kid, all of this music that became kind of known as American music or Americana. But by far the greatest of these pieces was the piece he composed in 1942-43, Appalachian Spring, which is arguably the greatest American composition composed. It was a ballet written for Martha Graham. And for the longest time, the title was Ballet for Martha. That was the only title he could come up with. And then I heard many different stories, but I guess the one I'm hearing was most accurate is Martha Graham was the one who titled it Appalachian Spring, after, after a poem. And the, the joke being that Copeland, you know, people would say, to him, oh, it sounds so much like the Appalachians. He captured it perfectly. And he, you know, it was completely out of later. had nothing, he didn't even cross his line. And he also joked that the poem refers to Appalachian Spring as water. You know, the spring is spring water, not the spring is the season. So, uh, so he found, you know, it's kind of funny, I mean, the title is taken on an ethos uh, beyond, the, you know, that, that's separate from the music. But the music really does conjure uh, you know, some of the best of what we think of America. He did intend it as a, it was the theme of it, was a pioneer family, Shakers actually, are building a house with the whole community helping. And so it had to do with this kind of, in, this idea of industry, beauty of nature, and a feeling that we can accomplish in everything. So it's American in that sense. Uh, it's a deeply moving piece, as I think you know, and I'm really excited that our city artists is at the level we do. Finally, we're doing, this is, Selfish on my part, one of my absolute favorite pieces. I've always dreamed of playing it, and that's Rodrigo's Concierto de Arguez. And Joaquin Rodrigo was a Spanish composer who wrote the greatest guitar concerto of all time. It was written uh, just a little bit before Appalachian Spring. And actually, as I will point out, the orchestra shares a lot of elements in common with Appalachian Spring. And uh, the piece has been used as Appalachian Spring. It's one of the most popular pieces in the 20th century because it's slow movement which has the greatest English horn solo in the, in the literature. And it's also a beautiful piece that fuses flamenco with old Spanish music from the Renaissance and the Baroque era, and with all of the kind of innovations of the 20th century that Copeland was interested in. You know, put, putting things together like hand diatonicism and all these other jargons that I'm leading into most of you. But, but it's, uh, it's an incredible piece, and I think we're going to have an unbelievable concert. Uh, so that's a little bit about the music. Uh, Tomas, are you here? Yes, Tomas. Tomas Volka, who is, is substituting for, uh, for some of our violin coaches, is an incredibly accomplished conductor. He conducts the Riverside Symphony. It's a great honor 
uh, for us, for me, and our orchestra. He's agreed to conduct the concerto on Juez, which I can play the guitar bar. You can't, you can't conduct the concerto on Juez. to do that. I think it's going to be exciting. It's amazing. And the other thing, this year we got too big for the Colburn School. Greatest uh, acoustics in LA, but we're too big for the stage. So Laura K. Swanson, who's a genius, as well as being our executive director, came up with the idea of Ambassador Auditorium. Now, I just want to say a minute about Ambassador because most of you don't know about it because Ambassador is a private college that restricts, that only has concerts for a few, few special people to bring it to. It's, but many people acknowledge it as the best concert hall in Los Angeles. And when I was a kid, younger than most of you, I got to hear Vladimir Horowitz play at Ambassador Auditorium. He, he, he deigned to play it. So I'd like to hear the greatest pianist of all time. let you know what a great, a great venue this is. So this is an incredible honor that we're going to be at Ambassador Auditorium. Finally, um, it's very exciting video. And then before I hand it over, I just want to talk in one sense about the Italy tour. I'm hoping as many of you as possible can join us for this tour of Italy. And I want you to know from my part, I'm going to make this tour not only are we going to play great music, but we are going to experience really deep music, how deep music is. There's two particular experiences that you probably would not get on other trips is we went to Cremona, which is where violin, the whole string family was born. That's where Stradivarius worked, that's where Bornarius worked, that's where Amati worked. And we're going to visit the Stradivarius Museum and go to a modern luthier to see how string instruments are made. All the string instruments we play, they all come, in a sense, from this little town in Italy. I've never been there, I'm very excited to go. It's going to be a trip of a lifetime. The other thing is I'm going to take you to a place that tourists never go to. I discovered it by accident in Rome. And that is the Benedictine Monastery. And in the Benedictine Monastery, they sing plain chant or Gregorian chant the same way that they've been doing since 800 AD. So you're going to be actually, this music, this plain chant is where all of our classical music comes from. Really all the music of Western civilization comes from this plain chant. And what a thrill is actually sitting there during, during a service to be able to hear these monks as they do five, six times a day singing the most gorgeous melody that you can imagine. And I think that uh, it changed my life hearing it, and I would like for all of you to have that experience. So that's uh, what I wanted to say. I'm so excited to begin this. I want to introduce to you now our very, very small but powerful staff. I'd like to begin with you giving a super warm welcome to Laura K. Swanson. Thank you. Thank you. Is the calendar, which is double sided. So this is 
detail for the entire year and it goes through the end of the tour. So review it, learn it, love it, know it, make sure you can be here. Okay? Um, put that on your fridge. Um, I'm going to skip the end of the tour for one second and come back to that. Um, important orchestra policies on page three. Okay? Um, Paul Piazza, who is our new orchestra manager and music librarian, is going to talk to you a bit about that. But I want to talk about volunteer hours. So, as I said, there are three of us, right? And our wonderful coaching staff. But it is essential the help of all of our parents volunteer for all these jobs make these rehearsals happen and make our concerts happen. So, basically, if you turn to the final page of your packet, you will see Leo here and volunteers. And you will see, if you have not already, you should already receive an email so that you can sign up on Sign Up Genius for a volunteer slot. So, there are a lot of different opportunities. We need people to help getting this rehearsal room set up. We basically move into your great city and tear it down every Sunday. So, we need people to help break it down at the end of the rehearsals. We need people to bring snacks so our kids have some sustenance at the break because they're working so hard. Their brains are working so hard to play this music, learn this music, listen to Russell, listen to the coaches, and take in everything that they're saying. Um, we also have a security person, and I want to just talk about that because kids are wandering around going from sectionals, going from into the tubers. We just want to make sure that everybody's where they're supposed to be. And also that we have a parent that's just kind of, you know, looking at the property and just making sure that there aren't any issues or any of the gear wandering around. I just, you know, like to have somebody with ties just on this property. Um, concert assistance. So that's a big thing. Um, I don't know if Cindy Goodman is here or not, uh, but she has taken care of um, she is taking care of basically the tickets for, gosh, how many of them? Two, three years? Um, this is uh, the last year that her son is in orchestra. So we are looking for someone who would like to basically be her, her intern, her apprentice, who can take over this job next year. So if you're interested in that, you can let me know. So it's a big job. She does an amazing job. She has been fantastic. I actually told her that she can never resign, but she's not here, so it's okay. Um, so concerts, basically, ticket sales, merch sales, because we do t-shirts and water bottles, etc. Um, ushers to hand out concert programs, and then backstage assistance. So when all the kids show up backstage at the venues, which will be UCLA Schoenberg, and as also said, the ambassador of like Florian Pasquina, they know where to go, where to put their instruments, where or when are they going on the stage, etc. etc. Um, a special thing for me is if you have special skills like maybe you've done marketing or PR, maybe you've written press releases, maybe you have done some kind of ad sales, something like that. Um, if you want to contact me directly about wanting to use your volunteer hours for helping me out with that, that would be amazing. That would be fantastic. Um, the other thing that I wanted, so you are required to do 10 hours of volunteer work uh, throughout the year. That's not for semester, that's throughout the year for family. Um, or, if you opt out, you just don't have time to do it, uh, you can get a $200 donation to lay out. So that's the opt out fee for, for, the, for the volunteer. Um, the other thing that we ask is for concert tickets. We require that each family buy five tickets, and that's five tickets per semester. So that's between the two concerts each semester. So, you know, you can buy them for your friends, and that should basically cover your family, you know, a couple of friends that come to the concert. It just makes sure that our concerts are full, that we have a really full audience for all of the hard work that these kids have been doing over the course of the semester. Um, so, there's also a page in here, I think it's page four, which is important my own contacts, 2016 17 season, okay? So, if you need to email me, my email is there, my phone number is there. Same thing with Russell, same thing with Paul. The coaches, if, if there's something that comes up, if you have a question, if you need to talk to them, you are welcome to contact, you are welcome to email, you are welcome to call them. So our volunteer coordinators, and it's sad to say that I think Valerie Lamina is not going to be continuing with us this year, but Anna Sander, where are you? Anna? Put your hand up right there. Thank you. So she's done so much work last year, she's back with us this year. She is basically your go to person. If you come to rehearsal, you don't know what to do, sign up for something, where does it go? Go to the kitchen and see Anna. She is essential, she's been amazing, um, she's a great help. So now we're going to talk about Italy. Woohoo! So, for those of you, yay! For those of you who don't know, uh, we are going to go on a performance tour of Italy next June. The tour is from June 19th to June 29th, 2017. Um, so, if you turn to the second page, 
through as much as $1,000 in raffle tickets. Details on that will follow. Uh, we've got some legal stuff we've got to do between now and when we kick off the official raffle. But I wanted to let you know that we are aware uh, that the tour does have a cost, and we want to try to help defray that cost where we can. Uh, does there anything else, please? So what I'm saying is going to is that in addition to all these wonderful conduct and educational experiences, don't worry, we'll have some time to go shopping. <laughs>
two weeks in advance. You don't have to, you know, you can CC Russell and Laura, but I'm the point person on that stuff. Make sure I know because I'm the one who's going to keep track of it. My email is the general Los Angeles Youth Orchestra email, leolis at gmail.com. Those emails come directly to me and I take care of them. So make sure two weeks before you know you're going to be absent, two weeks before, unless it's a medical emergency or something, let us know in advance like that. Because then we plan the whole rehearsal schedule around maybe some instruments are lighter certain weeks. So it's really important. It's not something to be taken lightly. It just it gets inconvenient otherwise. But really appreciate your help on that one. Uh, in an emergency situation, my number is there on your contact sheet. And I really encourage you guys, even at this meeting, put it in your phones. Because I'm because I'm the point person on as much of this stuff, and I try to kind of take care of as many things on the ground level as possible. Parents, go ahead and call me with any concerns. Students, call me with any concerns, anything you think might be coming up, even if you're not sure you're going to be absent. Or if you think, you know, this semester's pretty busy, we're, we're still struggling with maybe deciding for next semester, give me a phone call. We want to be in the loop, and I'd love to be able to talk to you guys about it. So that covers, I think, the attendance stuff. Man, for dress rehearsal at the concerts, two weeks before you email me or get in touch with me, you have my contact information, leolis at gmail.com. Uh, the other aspect of my job is the music library. So today, after we set up for the orchestra rehearsal, we are going to lay out your sheet music on your chairs in the duty rehearsal. Coaches, I will be handing you your sheet music to walk back with your sections, or you can assign one of your, one of your kids to take it from you, and they will take it with them to your sectional location. So that would be a nice, nice printed book that's everything like that. But more importantly, if you, is everybody getting my emails? Is everybody in the room? Please, please raise your hand if you've not gotten an email from leolis at gmail.com in the last seven minutes. Please raise them high. Okay, so no excuses, right? <laughs> Um, we have a Dropbox folder that has all of the sheet music for the semester. And it's especially important for string players. String players, raise your hands in both both ensembles. Yeah. So as the semester goes on, the coaches and the section leaders and Russell, we're all going to get together and at different times make updates to those, those pieces of music with phone and things like that. And it's really important when I send an email in the middle of the semester saying, string players, updated bones on Dropbox, that you go to Dropbox, that you download the music that should be pretty easy to find, it should just be right that instrument, and mark those bones into your parts. If you do that, these rehearsals go very quickly. If you don't, then we have to spend time in large groups doing that. So that's important for them, but I would also say everybody go ahead and download the parts that are up there, and because you never know, there's going to be that one day you forget your music, and thank God you printed something out, and it just happens to be next to you, and you can take it with rehearsal music. So it's really important, download the music, print it out for yourself, have extras, have seven or eight different copies. Just float them around the house. Anyway. Okay. Here's kind of the, the most critical part. We hinted at with that tennis stuff. As an orchestra manager, I really am the, the point person for any concerns you have, not just about attendance, but you know, if the girl uh, next to you has been calling you names, or if the, if the boy mostly trumpet players next to you and smelling or something, you know, let me know. Because the sooner I know about any potential issues, or if you're not doing this too, you can say nice things about them, huh? do whatever you want. But the sooner we know about issues, the sooner we can fix them. And the worst thing in the world, and I, I've been involved with, with organizations like this, where people hold, they, they just don't tell anybody that there's an issue, and they think the whole semester, and then they don't sign up again the next year because something wasn't quite right, quite right. And all they had to do was tell somebody who would have tried to work something out. So please, again, my number, please put it in your phones, everybody in the room, 818-857-6251 is on your sheets, and call me with any issues whatsoever. The last thing I'm going to say before I hand the microphone back to Russell is that after this meeting ends, in terms of this room, we will need to set it up for the symphony orchestra. The symphony orchestra rehearses 2T first. So what I'm going to ask is all parents and all concert orchestra students, please make sure as quickly as you can at this meeting is to get away from the center of the room. I'm going to ask anybody who's sitting in a chair over there, take those chairs as soon as you can, as soon as the meeting's over, pull them up and put them in these in these over here. Just let's clear the room as quickly as possible, especially the first four rows of stuff. That will really help us because we got to move percussion back. We got to add more rows to the first album. So please, after this meeting ends, don't just loiter around in this room really in the way of setting up works for rehearsal. And I'm going to deputize the string players in the symphony orchestra, except for the basses. The string players in the symphony orchestra, I'm deputizing you to help put the rest of the chairs back together for the first violins and the second violins. 
scoop of uh, uh, scoops and exchange and things like that. Okay, string players and symbiotic orchestra. Can you raise your hands? String players and symbiotic orchestra. Good. So right after this meeting is over, I'm going to be sitting right here, and I want to see a bunch of you around me. And, uh, and we'll get to talk later, but this will really help us set up. Thank you so much, everybody. It's really nice to be here. Looking forward to getting to all of you. Thank you. As you can see, we have a small but pretty amazing staff. I just, we're, we're going to finish up in a second. I have so many traditional coaches. <laughs> Yeah. After me. After me. But one second. Um, what Paul said about the, uh, the, the attendance is something you know, we deal with. We spend an enormous amount of time with about 3 to 5% of the students and parents because of the misunderstandings. I, I want you to hear it from me, not just from, from Laura and Paul. But it is very important. You know, we make it mandatory that for participation orchestra, you have to be able to play both concerts because that's the culmination of all the work. If we have people who are rehearsing and they're not there for the concerts, that makes it's like we don't really have what we need to do the concerts. That's, so check those dates. We also need everyone present the week before. We call our dress rehearsal. And the reason should be obvious. That's the only we have to make sure that everyone is absolutely present before you know, so we can have a run through before we do the concert. So I just ask you to double check those dates. One other issue that will come up, because it's always an emotional issue for all of us, is seating placements. Where are you sitting, where, where are you sitting in the orchestra? Who's ahead of you? Who's behind you? It's amazing how much in an orchestra you become like pigeons. Any of you have a pigeon coop? My brother had a pigeon coop going up. You see the pigeons all line up by, you know, by who's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then they have fights to see who's, you know, that's the same as a sectional uh, auditions. They have fights to see who's going to uh, so It is very important that we, we, do, we, we do have to have these auditions because it's what motivates human beings to practice and be their best. But at the same time, I want all the parents and students to understand the real victory is your in the orchestra. That is, it, it, I know it doesn't seem like it really, and whether you are in front or behind is not going to determine your station in life, I promise you. But I need to let you know that because it's always a very emotional thing. And I just want you to know that we try to be as fair as possible, and it doesn't, it's like any system, it's not 100% perfect or accurate. One of the things that makes this orchestra different than other orchestras and more effective is that we use a kind of European mentoring model. Instead of having coaches come once in a while near the end, we actually work with incredible professional music, musicians at every rehearsal. I'm going to introduce them to you, and then I'm going to have, and then the students, you're going to go follow your coaches. The, the, the uh, symphony orchestra will stay here for rehearsal, and the concert orchestra will follow their coaches. And what we're going to do is, just to give you the idea for the rest of the day, we're going to go from I guess from 2.30 to 3.30 will be our first rehearsal, and we'll take a break, and we'll all come back here, and then from 4 to 5, we'll, we'll have the second rehearsal, concert orchestra here. So it'll be a short rehearsal. But this information is important, there's so many new people. Last thing I want to say before I introduce the coaches is that Laura said, we, we really, um, this is the only meeting we have all semester, and we really want parents who are interested to get involved. I've always found if I have interesting students, it's like the parents are equally interested. And what has enriched this orchestra so much is when the parents give up themselves and their talents to help us. So if you feel you want to get involved, like there's a ticketing, or you want to help with the tour, or you want to help, we have lots of great needs. We're not associated with the school. We, we don't have a lot of the infrastructure orchestras need to keep going. So I really depend on the wealth of experience, knowledge, and willingness of the parents. So I just want to say that. And I want to again welcome all of you. So I'm going to now introduce the coaches um, and, uh, and have them come up here. So I think we'll start first with Paul Sternhagen. Paul? Yeah, Paul. There's a Semester. So, percussion students are going to go to Paul. Uh, John Haney, 